Okay, Psalm number 10. Psalm number 10. We are studying the book of Psalm, going through the book of Psalm. We call it probing Psalms, and we've taken some time to uh, look at uh, these Psalms. Very, very precious uh, 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 songbook of Israel, God's theological songbook. And uh, Psalm number 10, as we looked at uh, a little bit of this last week, we mentioned how some, some uh, critical text links Psalm number 9 and Psalm number 10 as one psalm, but the Hebrew Masoretic text, uh, the basis for the King James Bible, uh, Old Testament, doesn't treat them as one psalm. Therefore, we cannot treat it as one psalm. And if you read it anyway, it, they're similar, but their emphasis is different. And so they should be treated as separate psalms. Uh, and uh, what we notice in Psalm 10 immediately is that Psalm 10 doesn't have an inspired heading. Uh, so um, that's one unusual thing within the book one of the five books of Psalms. If you remember, there are five divisions, and book one is from uh, Psalm 1 to Psalm number 41. And usually in book one, there's a lot of inspired headings, and Psalm 10 is one that doesn't have an inspired heading. Uh, and so that's something that we will notice, all right? And also, uh, let me just say that this psalm has a potential for being a prophetic psalm, a psalm that looks into the future. And the reason I say that is because of uh, two or three things here. Uh, number one, uh, Psalm 10 uses the term the wicked five times. You read about the wicked. <clears throat> now go over, for example, to uh, keep your finger in Psalm 10, Go over, for example, to uh, 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians, <clears throat> very uh, prophetic uh, epistle of Paul to the church at Thessalonica as he's um, correcting their perspective on the second coming of Christ. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, verse number 8. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. Uh, talking about the beast, the Antichrist. And it says in verse number 8, Then shall that wicked, then shall that wicked, and it's a capital W, so this is a particular person. This is the Antichrist. Uh, that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Well, praise the Lord. We're so thankful that uh, the Antichrist is not going to win. In the end, uh, we, you can read the Bible, the winner, uh, the winning team is the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so everyone who is in Christ, you're on the winning side. Amen. And the wicked, the Antichrist, uh, will be consumed and uh, will be destroyed, shall be consumed, shall be destroyed by Jesus Christ. But notice he's called the wicked. That's another title, another name for the Antichrist is the wicked. All right, so let's go back to Psalm 10. Again, we find the wicked in verse number 2. You see there, the wicked. You find him in verse number 3, the wicked. Verse number 4, the wicked. Verse number 13, the wicked. And verse number 15, the wicked. So five times you have the, the name, the wicked. Uh, over and over again. Uh, he's also known as uh, the evil man. Look at verse number, uh, let's see here, verse number 15. <clears throat> verse number 15, the evil man. Do you see that? Verse number 15, the evil man. He's also known in verse number 18 as the man of the earth. The man of the earth. Verse number 18, the man of the earth. And so these are, significant names. These are significant titles that uh, give us a hint that this psalm can look well into the future. So it was written, 
I believe by David years ago, you know how many thousands of years ago this psalm was written, and yet it still speaks to uh, our, our future. We're not even there yet, and uh, it already speaks to the future. That's how uh, mighty and powerful and relevant the Word of God is. Uh, so not only do we find the wicked, there's also uh, a term in verse number one, times of trouble, times of trouble. Look at that. Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? In times of trouble. Go over to uh, uh, Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah chapter 30. And verse number 7, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse number 7. Again, a prophetic look into the future. It's interesting that uh, the tribulation period is called Jacob's trouble. You see that? Jeremiah chapter 30, verse number 7. Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse number 7. Alas, for that great day, uh, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It won't be any day like the day of the Lord. It's going to be a great day, um, devastation, great judgment, and also after the judgment, great joy. Uh, it is not. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. You see the word trouble. <laughs> the time of Jacob's trouble, and that's why we know that uh, God has a plan and a purpose for Israel. And part of that plan is that they have to go through a period of time called the, the day of the Lord, called the time of Jacob's trouble. So go back to Psalm 10. You find that times of trouble, times of trouble. <clears throat> go over to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. <clears throat> Prophetically looking into the future. You find uh, Daniel's 70th week uh, that hasn't taken place yet. <clears throat> Look at verse number 25, Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Look for trouble there. Now, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks and the street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. Even in troublous times. And so definitely in God's prophetic calendar, uh, Israel is, uh, uh, has an appointment with the day of the Lord. <clears throat> now, uh, the New Testament born-again believer, uh, the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, uh, <clears throat> They are not uh, designed to go through. They're not appointed unto wrath, the Bible says. Uh, but Israel certainly is, because that's the way that God gets their attention. And so, uh, looking at Psalm 10, we see these words, we see these terms, and we see the, the, the theme of uh, the wicked ruling and the poor are oppressed, and it's as if God uh, was... Uh, wasn't there as if God isn't doing anything. <clears throat> well, that day is coming. That day is coming when uh, the Holy Spirit of God will be taken out of the way. And the Antichrist, the wicked, will have his way here on earth. <clears throat> he, will, he will rule and reign uh, for seven years. It'll be his program. Uh, and it's as if God, where is God during these troubled times? Where is the Lord? And uh, it's as if the Lord is standing afar looking at the wrong and not doing anything about it. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, David here uh, presents us with that picture. The, the disadvantage in the entire Psalm, the, the, those that are disadvantaged are called the poor, the innocent, the humble, the fatherless, and the oppressed. Five names for the disadvantaged. 
and all of them are parallel. So it's not like, you know, he's just dealing with the poor and the innocent here. The poor are the innocent, are the humble, are the fatherless, and the oppressed. So they're the ones that are being oppressed by the Antichrist. <clears throat> and so, uh, uh, let me just say, uh, Israel will make a deal with the Antichrist, <clears throat> and uh, the seven-year contract, uh, in the middle of the seven-year contract, the Antichrist will set himself up as God. He wants to be worshipped as God. And that's when uh, Israel will realize, whoa, we made a big mistake. Uh, we, we, did, we thought he was the Christ, but he is not the Christ. He is the end to Christ. All right, so not a good thing. But what is God doing? As the Antichrist is ruling and reigning and doing his thing, what is God doing? <clears throat> we can look at it today in our situation as Christians. We see great injustice, don't we? I mean, we see a lot of injustice in this world. Innocent lives being killed, murdered. Uh, innocent uh, babies being destroyed by abortion. <clears throat> we see... Uh, homosexuality running around rampant what is God doing why is the Lord allowing this to take place and what is the Christian response to this problem of injustice uh, <clears throat> so that that is what Psalm 10 is all about that is exactly what Psalm 10 is all about and so we'll look at that in a little bit now the outline of Psalm 10. Now, in the outline, uh, we talked about uh, a device called a chias chiasmus, chiastic device, a chiasm, chiasm. You remember that uh, when I said, I eat because I'm stressed, I'm stressed because I eat, and that forms a chiasm. Let me get my... Uh, you know, a chiasm comes from the Greek letter chi, and it, lo it looks like an X. <clears throat> looks like an X, and, uh, you know, there's I eat because I am stressed. <laughs> I am stressed because I eat. <laughs> so you see... Uh, the chiasm, the, the key, the letter key in Greek, parallels these things. And it, this device makes the, the, um, the saying potent and remember uh, memorable. And so there is a chiasm in Psalm 10. Okay, the chiasm in Psalm 10 uh, forms the outline of the psalm. Interesting, the Roman numeral is also X, right? No, I'm just, that's just a coincidence. Nothing fancy about that. <clears throat> so, the, uh, the rule of the wicked, or the reign of the wicked. Whoa, I tell you what. Let's make my handwriting nicer, right? The rule of the wicked, <clears throat> or the reign of the wicked, that would be, I'm sorry. Ah, get my notes here. The question of divine justice. Verse number one, the question of divine justice, <clears throat> the question of divine justice, verse number one, is answered by the answer of divine justice in verses number 17 and 18. Okay, 
So you see that verse number 1 is answered by verses number 17 and 18. <clears throat> then you have the reign of the wicked... The reign of the wicked in uh, <clears throat> verses 2 to 11. The reign of the wicked and the reign of the Lord. Answers the reign of the wicked <clears throat> in verse number 16. So then if you look at all these verses, the only verse that's missing is verses number 12 and number 15. And that forms the heart of the chiasm. This is the heart of the chiasm, verses number 12 to 15. And uh, the heart is the prayer. The prayer for deliverance. So you have the question of divine justice in verse 1. Where is God? What are you doing, Lord? Why are things going wrong? Why are bad things happening to good people? Why is it that the wicked are prospering? What about those who are not wicked? Why are they losing? Why are they suffering? Why is there even suffering? I mean, if the Lord is almighty and good and sovereign, why does he allow evil to happen? How come he created Adam, knowing that Adam would fall in sin? I mean, didn't God know? Didn't he make preventative maintenance? <laughs> you know? Well, the question of divine justice. This is the reason why there are atheism. People who can't wrap their head around the idea of a good God allowing sin uh, to, to prevail or to have a, a, a dominance. So the question of divine justice answered by verses 17 and 18, and we'll look into that. And then the reign of the wicked and the reign of the Lord. Okay, so you have the chiasm. And in every chiastic key has a heart or a center, or a point where they're driving you to. And we are driven to the solution in pray, of prayer. Now remember, Christian, the most important thing you can do as a Christian is pray. And that's exactly what David did in Psalm 10 when he's contemplating the injustices and the things that are happening uh, uh, it ought to drive us to pray, all right? And so we see how prayer is very, very significant. <clears throat> if you're not a praying Christian, you're missing out on a, a lot of things. All right, so let's look at the psalm now that we got the outline, the general chiasm uh, in perspective, okay? All right, so Psalm 10, why? Here's the question of... Uh, uh, the question of divine justice. <clears throat> Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? And certainly if you live life long enough, you, you at times would an ask God why. Now, knowing why doesn't change the facts that we still live in a world of sin, that God allowed sin to, to, to uh, rule and reign. And it's, it is as though the Lord is hiding himself. So what do you do in times when it appears that God is not there? Well, we know the answer now, right? We know the answer. What do you do? When, it, when, when time comes and trials and testings come and you feel like the Lord is hiding himself, this is what you do. You pray. You pray. You draw close to the Lord. You have fellowship with the Lord. You draw near to him in prayer. And so that's important. So verse number two, the wicked in his pride doth per uh, persecute the poor. So the wicked is reigning. 
And the entire section from verse number 2 to verse number 11 is all about the wicked. What's the wicked doing? What's he doing? <clears throat> well, we can see that he's doing uh, three functions, mainly. There are three things the wicked is doing. Number one, his pride. He's exercising his pride. And his pride prevents him from seeking God. His pride prevents him from seeking God. Uh, let's look at verse number two. The wicked in his pride doth pro persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices they have imagined. For the wicked boasteth, that's pride, of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord hath whoreth. The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. So <clears throat> when you're dealing with atheism, you're dealing with pride. Uh, a person that's full of pride. Not thinking about the Lord. Not seeking after God. God is not in all his thoughts. That is an atheist. And you ask an atheist, uh, is, is God real? No, God is, there is no God. <laughs> Uh, and it's probably atheism uh, is fueled by this idea of, well, if God's real, then how come there's sin? You see that? And so this is a, 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 a psalm that makes us aware of this thing. Number two, the wicked thinks that God has forgotten his sins, that God is nowhere to be found. Look at verse number 11. Verse number 11. He hath said in his heart, God hath forgotten. He hideth his face and he will never see it. And so he convinced himself that uh, God's not going to bring justice to this world. I can do what I want to do. Hey, people, man, leave, leave people alone. Let them do what they want to do. <clears throat> because this is the only life you have to live. And man, uh, you know, just live it up. And uh, there's no reckoning. There's no day of judgment. I mean, what? this is the only heaven there is. And uh, there is no hell. There is nothing. When you die, it's over. It's a termination of cessation of life. And so uh, live it up. That's the philosophy of the atheist, uh, uh, <clears throat> the wicked. Uh, verse number 13, he does not think that God will hold him accountable. Look at verse 13. Wherefore doth the wicked contemn God? He had said in his heart, Thou will not require it. Hey, there is no judgment. There is no afterlife. <laughs> there is no time where I'm going to face the Lord in judgment. This is how the wicked thinks. This is what he believes. And so, uh, no accountability. You do what you want to do. And... When you look at the scriptures, uh, it says, the, verse number five, His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above, out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. It's interesting how the Psalms takes the words of the wicked and uh, highlights the words of the wicked as a puff. Puff, that breath. And it's also interesting how the Bible contrasts that with the words of the Lord. And by the way, the words of the Lord are given by inspiration. For all scripture is given by inspiration. God puffs too, you know. He puffs words too, just like the wicked. The difference is the words of the Lord will endure forever. The words of the Lord are perfect. The words of the Lord are pure. The words of the Lord will never lie. The words of the wicked, they are deceitful. Look at verse number, uh, verse number seven. His, uh, well, let's look at six first and six and seven. He had said in his heart, I shall not be moved for I shall never be in adversity. That's a lie. Verse 7, his mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. It really doesn't matter what the wicked says. 
Uh, their tongue is full of emptiness, worthlessness, vanity, foolishness, mischief. <clears throat> Verse 8 is deceitfulness, hiding. He, seek it, he, he sitteth in the lurking places of the villages. In secret places doth he murder the innocent. His eyes are privily set against the poor. He lieth in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lieth in wait to catch the poor, and doth catch the poor, and he draweth him into his net. He croucheth and humbleth himself, that the poor may fall by his strong ones. He hath said in his heart, God hath forgotten. He hideth his face. He'll never see it. So it seems, there are times when it seems that the wicked are prevailing. They're ruling and reigning. <clears throat> ruling and reigning. So, <clears throat> what's the proper response? When, when things are not going the way of the Lord, when, when it seems that God is hiding himself. Look at verse number 12. Here is the proper response. Verse number 12. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up thine hand, forget not the humble. David goes to God in prayer. Goes to God in prayer. Uh, I cannot stress, I've spent several weeks talking about prayer before we got into the study of Psalms. You can look over the previous lesson. We spent weeks and weeks on the idea of prayer. And I believe that prayer separates uh, weak Christians from strong Christians. Uh, if you want to be a strong Christian, then develop the habit of prayer. Because prayer... Uh, is what makes the difference here. I mean, God, you know, the Lord's grace, of course, comes when we uh, ask for prayer, through prayer, the Lord's power, the Lord's grace, the Lord's divine enablement. Uh, when things are going wrong, what do you do? You pray, you see. Verse number uh, uh, 12, Arise, O Lord, lift up thine hand, forget not the humble Wherefore doth the wicked contemn God? He had said in his heart, Thou wilt not require it. For thou hast seen it, for thou beholdest mischief in spite to requite it with thine hand. The poor committeth himself unto thee. Thou art the helper of the fatherless. You see how the Lord takes up for the poor, the humble, the fatherless. The Lord intervenes. Uh, but you need to be in prayer for that. You need, you want to ask God to intervene in your situation or in somebody else's situation. Uh, prayer is the key. That's the Christian response. What's the Christian response to the, the injustices of the world? Should we march? Hmm? Should we take up placards and march and, and demonstrate out in the streets, you know? rallies, join a rally. No. <laughs> the Christian response is a personal relationship with the Lord and talking to Him in prayer and asking God, Lord, will you show yourself, would you manifest yourself in a powerful way on behalf of the godly and on behalf of the ungodly, on behalf of the wicked, that they might see your strength, they may see your glory, would you convict? Would you convert? I mean, asking God to do the impossible. You should be in prayer, you see. Prayer is the Christian response to the problem of the justice of God. All right, <clears throat> let's uh, see here. Uh, uh, verse number 15, verse number 15. Break thou... The arm of the wicked. Uh, when it says arm there, it's talking about his um, instrument of violence, his power, his sin. We're asking God to destroy the, the instrument of violence, the arm of the wicked. Uh, <clears throat> Break thou the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness till thou find none. We're asking God to intervene. We're asking God to take control. <clears throat> Look at Psalm 37. This is parallel to Psalm 37. Very similar prayer request, but these are very good prayer requests. We should be asking God to break the arm of the wicked. We should be asking God to uh, uh, seek out his wickedness. 
until there is no more to see. Uh, ask God for the defeat of the wicked. Psalm 37, verse 17. Psalm 37, verse 17. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken. Well, that's a promise from God. But the Lord upholdeth the righteous. See, you should pray. Lord, will you uphold me? Lord, would you bless me? Lord, would you strengthen me? And we have scriptural reasons and grounds to pray these kind of prayers. This is what makes Psalm so important because Psalm, the book of Psalms, will inform you how to pray, what to pray, how to communicate to the Lord. Learn how to pray these prayers. These, these are imprecatory prayers. Uh, the word imprecatory means cursing. But we're not cursing just anyone. We're cursing the Lord's enemies. We're cursing those that are cursing God's people. And so as Christians, we have the right and the privilege of going to God and laying before Him these things and then taking them up to Him in prayer. All right, so let's see here. Uh, uh, verse number 16. The Lord is king forever and ever. There's the reign of the Lord. <laughs> okay. So the, the wicked thinks they're reigning and ruling, but really it is the Lord who is sovereign. The Lord, the king, is uh, uh, the Lord is king forever and ever. The heathen are perished out of his land. Okay. This is the Lord's... Uh, 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 world. Uh, verse number 17, Lord, thou has heard the, the desire of the humble. Okay. And so and th does the Lord hear you pray? Does God hear you pray? He wants to hear you pray. And he heard the desire of the humble. And so always develop, cultivate that life of prayer. The Bible says pray without ceasing. And we should be doing that. Uh, thou wilt prepare their heart. This is what God does. He prepares our heart. That means He strengthens us. You ever go to God uh, weary and, and wore out in trouble, but then when you leave prayer, when you're done praying and you seek the Lord, you ever felt that strength of heart that all of a sudden it comes back to you, you know, that, hey, God's with you. Hey, God will take care of it. Hey, God will strengthen your heart. That's what God does. And so it's so important to have a right relationship to God with prayer. All right? God uses that as a way of strengthening us. Uh, and thou will cause thine ear to hear. Oh, God wants to hear our prayers. Uh, now, the problem is not unanswered prayer. The problem is unoffered prayer. Remember that. Verse number 18. To judge the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may no more oppress. And the man of the earth here, of course, is uh, picturing the Antichrist. <clears throat> so God does two things. In verse number 17, he prepares their heart, the heart of the humble. He strengthens the heart of the humble. Number two, he will hear their prayers. He will hear their prayers and divine judgment will be given to the man of the earth. Someday the Lord will settle the score and the Antichrist will be defeated and uh, he will be cast into the lake of fire. So there's Psalm 10. What is the main lesson in Psalm 10? The main lesson is Jesus will bring divine justice to earth someday. Okay, so today uh, we don't, we're not promised justice. I mean, if you get justice today, that's a great thing. That's a rejoicing thing. That's a thankful thing. But I don't think this earth will know true justice until Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning as king in Jerusalem. Only then will we have divine justice. By the way, you want to know what the greatest injustice is in all the world? The greatest injustice. Go over to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. <clears throat> Speaking of injustice and justice. And, uh, look over in 1 Peter chapter 3. Here's, here's a 
probably the greatest injustice in the entire world. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. That's injustice. That Christ, the Son of God, the Lord of glory, the second person of the Trinity, God manifest in the flesh, huh? the author and finisher of our faith, the Messiah Christ, suffered for our sins, hmm? the just for the unjust. Who paid for our sins? Certainly not him who is guilty. It's not the one who's guilty who paid for our sins. Mm -mm. It's Jesus Christ, the just, suffering for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. And so you find the Trinity there. God the Father uh, is the one. Jesus brings us to God the Father, uh, and quickened, but quickened by the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit of God mm -mm, uh, applies the blood of Jesus Christ upon us when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And so when you think of suffering and wrong, study the cross of Jesus Christ. Consider Him. Think about what He had to go through to bring us to God. And uh, then you will see it's on the cross that everything that we know about the Lord is manifested. His mercy is there. His wrath is there. His uh, grace is there. His anger, divine judgment is there. It all meets on the cross. It all points to the cross. And if you uh, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you are, through His suffering, you are brought to God. Oh, you have a special relationship with the Lord because of Jesus Christ. All right, so uh, talk about injustice. There is no more greater injustice than Jesus dying on the cross for us. We are the ones who deserve punishment for our sin. We are the ones who deserve eternity in the lake of fire. Oh, but thankfully, Jesus Christ said, came down and took upon him our sins. And if you trust in Him as your Lord and Savior, you will never see divine judgment. You will have grace, all of God's grace, poured on you here on earth. And then when you die, well, you got heaven, huh? the glories of heaven forever and forever. Totally undeserved, totally not deserved. <laughs> uh, that answers this. The answer to divine justice is that personal relationship with Jesus Christ and through prayer. All right, let's pray and ask the Lord to bless them. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the wisdom and the, uh, the righteousness of the word of God. We thank you, Lord, that uh, although we look at this world that's marred by sin, destroyed by sin, uh, fallen in sin, uh, we also see the cross of Jesus Christ and how he took upon him all of our sins and that he will make everything right someday. When he comes back and rules and reigns in Jerusalem, he will rule with a rod of uh, 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 iron rod, Lord, and he will crush all his enemies, Lord, and he will bring divine justice on earth forever. We thank you, Lord, for that. And Lord, we ask that you would bless our time in the scriptures. I pray this will be an encouragement to those that will listen. Uh, help us, Lord, to develop a heart of prayer that we may see your glory manifested in our lives. Uh, even in times of trouble, we can see your hand upon us, Lord. And so I pray that you would bless this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. All right. God bless you. And uh,